The addiction itself is just a symptom of the trauma that's underneath. Most people go in with judgment rather than curiosity. Not many people actually understand the psychology behind addiction. So the first thing I would say is educate yourself. The surface level problem, like the addiction, is not really the problem. It's what's driving, it's the trauma that's driving the addiction, that's mm. the problem. You're not going to beat the addiction with more shame. It needs to be given love, it needs to be given room. They need to feel safe enough to actually express what created the addiction. Everybody yeah. just wants to be away from the pain. Distraction, yeah. uh, drug abuse, and so on and so forth. Overworking, overtraining, it's just basically running away. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Embodied Business Coach, entrepreneur and all-round rock star. Casey is one of my dear friends of many years. I've walked alongside, crawled alongside, and learned alongside. There's been lots of snots, tears, and laughter along the way. Casey, it's absolutely epic to have you on the show today. Welcome. How are you doing? Oh, I'm so good. And I'm so excited to be here. As you said yesterday, it's like we haven't actually dove like dive deep into a conversation in it's been a good 12 months before we've had this level of depth. So I'm excited. Let's do it. Let's start excavating. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> That's a word. That's definitely a word right now. <laughs> That's a word. Casey's going through some incredible wins in her life right now. So Really quickly, we'll uh, briefly go back to the early days, early days of life. If you can give us uh, a quick cap, what life was like growing up, what what life was like for you growing up, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, a few more stories along the way. Yeah, so for me, I grew up with my parents being addicts, um, alcoholics. There was drugs involved. There was lots of different things, and they separated at eight years old. So when I was eight, I should say. So it was very much um, that next five years was intense. We moved around. We had moments of homelessness as a family. Um, and yeah, it was just like them trying to clean themselves up and and really pull their life back in together. Um, they obviously stayed separated, but now it's just this completely different world that I live in, right? So like when I was 16, I had this dream of joining the military and I had a critical asthma attack that almost cost me the dream of the military. And then when I finally was 18, I joined the military. And <laughs> that was really where my whole story starts for myself personally, because I went into the military thinking that that was going to be my safe zone and where I was going to spend the rest of my days being in service to others and doing the thing. And I actually was discharged 18 months after being in for like a quite a severe back injury. And so the back injury really started my work in the personal development space. I spent a good five years after being booted out, deep in depression, anxiety, all the things. And it was just a real up and down roller coaster. And um, the rehabilitation of that back injury led me into personal training, which then became my business, which then led me into understanding that there's way more than just a gym it's also what's going on in the mind and the spirit and the body all the other things that started interconnecting and so it was like this progression of like following the breadcrumbs through my life and you know that led into coaching which led into working with women in relationships which led into business coaching which led into me where I am now <laughs> that's the very short short version of it all <laughs> that's a a, a 20,000 feet overview is that correct if life was only so straight lined as that, what? <laughs> or is in between there? You'd be yes. like, oh, well, that's why she's like Yes, this. <laughs> exactly. And I've had the privilege of knowing you for, what, six, seven years now. And um, I've got to witness a lot of the breakdowns, the breakthroughs and the, the snots, tears and all the things that has helped <laughs> you get to this level in life. So it's a privilege to be here beside you and um, work alongside you too. Just coming mm -hmm. all the way back, you mentioned the uh, addiction in your childhood and yeah. your parents. Um, please explain or elaborate a bit more on, you know, some of the feelings you felt um, mm -hmm. around that time. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting because, you know, they say that people become a warning or an example, right? And mm -hmm. for me, it was kind of like I always knew it was a warning. It was always like that's not the road you're leading. And I remember. Um, at like eight years old, I was sitting there and I was watching my mum dig through the couch 
for a 99 cent loaf of bread at the time, back in the day when bread was still $1, right? <laughs> right. She's digging through and she had like 70 cents and I was asking her for something. I can't remember what it was. And she was like, just shut up. I'm trying to find some money. Like she was angry as, right? And in that moment, I had this download, this thing of like, this won't be your life. This uh-huh. won't be your life. Like just trust. And it was it was really weird because I didn't know what that was, but somehow or other I never attached to what my story was or my circumstance was as a child. And so no matter what we were going through, I think I think a lot of kids, they go through this kind of upbringing where there's domestic violence, there's, you know, a lack of stability in the home and all those sorts of things, and it can feel scary and it can feel lost. But what I'd actually done as a child was dissociate from all my emotions. And so mm-hmm. I was like, you know what, I've just got to make sure we get through and like, you know, and I was always the strong one. So I built this mask of like, it doesn't matter what comes at me. I'm adaptable. I'm so strong because I know that this is not where I'm going to end up being, but it did create like quite a bridge for me later on in life to try and actually Uh tap into what that little girl needed. Uh But in the moment, I remember thinking, you know, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Like I'd see moments where my mom and dad were literally bashing each other. It wasn't just one or the other. It was like, you know, both of them going at it. And it felt like normal life. It felt like that's where we're at in this stage of life. And so it wasn't, um, it didn't feel unfamiliar is what I'm trying to get at. So Mm -hmm. I was used to the chaos. I was used to the, that level of life. But I remember as I would have been about maybe like 10 years old. I went over to one of my girlfriend's houses and we lived in the housing commission just outside of the rich area, right? Uh So I was the poor girl with all the rich kids. like. And I went into one of the houses one day and I walked in there and I thought to myself, I wonder what secrets this family has. Uh And that's when I kind of started to like catch myself at 10 years old being like, is that normal? Like, yeah, every family has secrets and stuff, but I'm not sure that that's actually normal. And I made a commitment to myself, like literally at like 10 years old being like, I don't ever want my family to have secrets. I don't ever want my family to have to hide anything. And so it's weird because as much as it was not the best upbringing, there was something that was already rising within me through it at a very, very young age. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm sure it's a lot. Obviously, you work through a lot of these things with your family over the years. Mm. And realizing the truth of the past is part of healing and letting that go brings closure for everybody, I would imagine, across the family. So, you know, speaking in terms of relationship with the family today, just touching on that subject, how is it? Honestly, it's next level. Like, my dad still often struggles with alcoholism and stuff like that. Like I'm not going to uh-huh. sit here and pretend it's all perfect. However, the relationship and the healing that has had to happen mm-hmm. in order for me to have a decent relationship is really good. And like, you know, I don't know what the outcome will be here, but I'm in conversations with my dad now about coming in and joining in some of this work and doing this kind of stuff with us. And uh-huh. for me, even being able to bridge that conversation, have those conversations just goes to show just how far along we have been Mm. the one thing I really want to comment on all of this was the thing that probably made my childhood what it was um in terms of not so bad like in my own view was Uh my parents never hid anything from me so I'm a 10 year old girl with all of this stuff I know about everything (laughs) like I'm going to grow fast I grew up very fast, Uh very fast. And so people would say to me at like 18, they're like, God, you're so wise for your age. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm watching drug dealers. You know, like it was, you know, it was big. And, um, but like, I'm just very grateful that I also watched the the rebuild. Mm -hmm. Um, I also watched the, what it looks like for people to choose their power over like an addiction like my mom is I love her so dearly because I just I'm able to talk to her so much also on the level of like she'll tell me what was going on when for her when all of this stuff was going down and like it's not 
this big juicy secret between us. Like, you mm-hmm. know, and I think that 10 year old girl who was like, I wonder what secrets are going on. It was like, she started to manifest the openness through the family as I got older, you know? So. Yeah. yeah that's quite- epic. That's yeah. epic. And I agree with you on that as well. Um, in terms of being open, but mm. also the life that you lived previously is what set the foundation for the life that you live today. Mm. Without any part of that, you wouldn't have needed to heal from X, Y, and Z, which wouldn't have led you down this path and wouldn't have led you down the path of service. And being a home mm. mother, a, a business owner, and yeah, impacting and like, basically globally. So mm. uh, yeah, well done with that. And just touching on the the juiciness of a secret or without needing to keep secrets. Yeah. How imperative is it to have an open uh, communication within a family dynamic? And what are the benefits of that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, one of our mentors, I remember hearing him say one day, um, if you don't own your story, it will own you. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I know to be true is like every time I've withheld something, I feel it in my body. Like it literally takes up so much space because I'm so tapped in now. It's like I can't do that bit where we withhold anymore. I just physically can't. Like, you know what I'm like. I'm an open book. If I've got an opinion, you're going to hear about it, right? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Damn but straight. I, <laughs> but I think I think it's one of those things where it's like shame conceals, guilt reveals. And so whether or not we think we're holding a secret, energetically we're still vibrating like that and like people always like oh you know I don't know what it is about that person but it just feels off and it's like there's usually because there's something that they're hiding and you can feel that energetically right it's like that old saying what we do in private we will wear in public Mm -hmm. and it might be like to protect other people that's why you're keeping the secret but what you're actually doing is creating separation from you and other people because Mm -hmm. if there's one thing that I've learned and I'm sure you can attest to this too with the work that we've done together is the more that shits out of your body, the more connected you feel to humanity and to everyone because we all have shit, all of ah, us. Like oh yeah. Oh yeah. the person <laughs> I've been in relationships prior to the current one and, and even the current one now, like I'm not perfect. None of us are. And so it's like looking at it from a perspective of like I can either put myself in a prison cell and play a certain role or I can just be honest with myself and give myself freedom simple oh so good so good um mm. just to highlight that you can put yourself in a prison cell and play, by playing a certain role or you can honor who you truly are and give yourself freedom just mm. to double down on that uh, for the listener what case is also saying is a lot of people wear masks and live up to this identity that's been set for them in society and the weight of that identity becomes so heavy it becomes a cage that traps us into further removing us from who we truly are. Mm. Uh, and that's why in today's society, a lot of people are lost, feel stuck, and uh, stick to that identity or fear career changes or relationship changes. Casey, you're saying you were about to say something there, far away. I was just going to say, like, that strong mass that I was talking about as a child, like, that Uh literally ruled my life for years. And Mm. so many women do this, especially with this whole masculine, like, women are too masculine, all the things. But, like, for me, I remember having that mask on and simultaneously being like, I just wish a man would come save me. Uh So, like, there's this mask and then there's this, like, victim behind it right? That was like, I just want someone to save me. I remember crying on my bedroom floor one day, just like literally curled up in a ball. Like I can't do this anymore. And so many people walk around like that all the time, having no idea that that's because they've built all these walls for protection. Every single day, they're walking around with all this guard, with all this armor on themselves. And it's like, what if you just dropped it? What if you let people see you? What would happen then? Ah, ah, ah. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing as well. If people really knew me, they would know, fill in the blank and just get the bigger secret off your chest because it becomes uh, liberating. It yeah. becomes liberating. There's a book that I share with a lot of my clients. They're untethered soul. Oh, yeah. 
which they speak about that same analogy, but it's a thorn in the side. So the mm. more you build stuff around it, yeah, so you're going through life not as the true you, you're going through life afraid to get that thorn triggered mm. at any stage of the game. So thank you for that wisdom case. I do want to bring it back real quick to, um, you know, you said growing up in a, in, in a household with addiction and, you know, what would you say to anybody that were either ex, uh, experience a, a similar upbringing that might be listening to this today? And also if somebody was on the way out of that, if they're a parent, how they could, you know, look after their children or help rebuild and remend relationships. Yeah, there's a couple of angles I'd like to hit this from. Firstly, it's the compassion piece of knowing that the addiction is not them. Like, and that, that for me, um, I remember I used to hold a lot of judgment and shame myself about, you know, what I experienced. And what I realized was it's like, you know, the, the addiction itself is just a symptom of the trauma that's underneath. Mm. And so it's when we can look beyond what someone is doing to numb their pain, we can start to be like, okay, like, this is big. Like I have like quite a strong, like claircognizance and clairvoyance and stuff like that. And I've had conversations with my dad, like straight up. I'm like, you see the shit that I see. Like, I know that you've got this same ability. And he's like, yeah, I do. And it scares him. So he'll numb it. Right. So it's like knowing why does someone do what they do is going to open the doors for you to be actually able to help them. Because the thing is most people go in with judgment rather than curiosity. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the judgment makes them feel even more isolated. So they turn to the thing that numbs the emotion of them feeling isolated, of them feeling that. So if they're like, oh, well, they don't like that I'm doing that, rather than going and facing off with it, if their addiction is strong enough, they're going to go deeper into it. And not many people actually understand the psychology behind addiction. So the first thing I would say is educate yourself. Firstly, you have to educate yourself on what it means to be someone who's navigating this from an internal standpoint, like me personally, the only, and I wouldn't even say they're drugs, the only thing I've ever played with now is natural plant medicines. I have never touched a drug in my life. And that is because of what I've witnessed growing up. But I think there's something to be said here for like when you have had someone in your in your world that uh, whether it's yourself or someone else navigating it, you're not going to beat the addiction with more shame. You just uh-huh. not. Like it needs to be given love. It needs to be given room and it needs to, they need to feel safe enough to actually express what created the addiction. And so uh, if someone feels like they're not welcome, they're not available, people can say all the right words, but energetically, if you don't know how to hold that, and it may also be their own stories as well, it can create a dissonance from them actually being able to lean in. So that's the first bit I would say is like really educate yourself on addiction versus just like you know like what they're doing essentially Uh Um, the second piece as the child in that position I would say don't lie and the reason why I say that is because I have been in a privileged position to have parents that didn't lie to me and what Uh they did was they set the standard of always speaking your truth And so growing up as an adult, I built a whole career of speaking my truth. And I think it's quite feisty too. (laughs) Yeah, quite feisty. Um, But it gave me room for self-expression. And I want you to think about as a parent, like if your children are watching you diminish yourself or not speak your truth, what you're teaching them is when they become an adult, they have to hide things from the world. And so I think... Like I know a lot of parents, people who are in this space will not want to admit it out of protection and all the things for their their family because they're like, oh my God, this is so dangerous. And there is also a way to share it powerfully um, that isn't going to impede on them. But I think, you know, it's really about, we see a lot of kids who rebel around the ages of 14 and 15. And look, I moved out of home and like just turned 16. So, you know, we see these kids who they rebel and they want to go out and, and do their own thing. And most of the time, the parents, they're playing like they're goody fucking two shoes and their kids are like, they want to experience. But the thing is, the parents kept that side of them 
concealed and so mm-hmm. the children are trying to experience it but like when you're just all of yourself with your kids and you're able to have these conversations they don't feel the call to go and do that like I lived out of home from 16 and never felt the call to go and be like that like I fucking studied I went to I worked my ass off at KFC to pay my bills and I like went through school and I almost went to law I got accepted in for law and criminology because I was just so fascinated with what everything was the only thing that made me not do that was I was also accepted to the military at the same time. And I was like, I can't afford that because my parents didn't pay for anything at that time. I had no one to cover. So I was like, fuck it, I'll go to the military. They can pay for my law degree. That was my thought process. And so that was the, that was the main reason why I, I decided military over doing something like that because I knew I needed to find safety in myself. But families who don't tell the truth they'll often suffer later on when their kids are older because their kids will like come back at them of like well you could have told me like I was strong enough kids no like I think there's this this concept that kids are dumb and that they're blind and I can tell you right now I saw everything (laughs) everything and when my parents would try and hide stuff from me it made it worse and I would just be straight up with them and they'd be straight up with me and it made it safer for me to know because I learned discernment. I learned how to hold myself in mm-hmm. adverse conditions. You know, like if you think you're protecting your child by hiding the truth from them, you're actually only protecting yourself from living up to what's actually here and denying mm-hmm. their, their path. Wow. That's really deep. Mm. That's really deep. And thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, touching on, you went into so basically the surface level pro- like the addiction is not really the problem it's what's driving it's the trauma that's driving the addiction that's mm-hmm. the problem yeah so when i look at both my parents that, yeah, yeah like both my parents they had hugely traumatic upbringings uh-huh. right huge and for the mo- most part like the first part of my childhood they were trying to do the right thing they were uh-huh. trying to get everything sort of but it caught up with them because they didn't have the tools to meet with it you know and I think this is where a lot of people, they think you must be stupid to choose that, but what they're actually looking for is a way to be out of pain. Yes. Gabon Mate speaks about that hugely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because ultimately that's what all this, everybody yeah. just wants to be away from the pain. Distraction, yeah. uh, drug abuse, and so on and so forth. Overworking, overtraining. Yeah, you're just basically running away. Mm, 100%. It's escape leadership through and through. And, yeah. you know, I think until we're ready ready to take radical responsibility for ourselves, like, you know, and, like, whilst I may not have had a drug addiction, I definitely had food addictions. I definitely had obsessions with men that were not healthy. Like, I did replace it with other things. And so once we start to take radical responsibility for ourselves and how we're handling our trauma and being with certain pieces, that's when we start to change the game and we can't do it until we actually decide that, okay, I'm the one that's at the center of everything right now. Yes. I love it. I love it. Thank you for sharing. Let's do a quick brief through you were in the military. I remember you, 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 you tell the story, you got an injury along the way. So you'll give us a, the next chapter. Yeah. So I, um, I joined the military just as October um 2009 just after my 18th birthday and not too long in I met my partner which became my fiance and I also was incredibly injured so most people um when they're marching you know we have to stride quite far and what I didn't realize is we went out field one day and I'm carrying this pack and you know I'm a you know 65 kilo woman with a 35 kilo pack on my back so it's like more than half my body weight right and my back just seized up like to the point where I couldn't walk. And so my corporal came and ripped the pack off my back. And then they they drove me straight into medical to get assessed. And all they did was give me some painkillers, made me rest for like overnight and then straight out field again. Anyway, because I had this injury that was pretty much just dulled with painkillers and I was also extending my step each time we were marching in it like squadron, what happened was my hips started getting all this pressure through them. So I 
By the time I left the military, it took them over six months to diagnose me. I had stress fractures through my hips, had bulging discs through my back, so L4, L5, had sacroiliac joint dysfunction, which is pretty much the tendons that joined my pelvis to my spine were just all fucked. And so I couldn't walk, essentially. I was like an old lady. I needed to lean on things. And I remember one day I was walking from one office to another on base and it would have been 100 metres and halfway through I fell to the ground and I just started crying because I was in so much pain to try and walk. I couldn't wear the boots. I was wearing runners because they were too, like, the boots were too heavy for me to lift my legs. And by this stage I'd already been pulled out of the course that I was in studying for my role. I just couldn't do it anymore. Like I felt like because of where my injury was right on the base of my coccyx as well and my spine, one day I'd walk on one side, I'd lean more on one side, so the other side was strengthened, and the next day I'd lean on the other side. And, like, all of my physicians knew this. It was a very common symptom for that kind of injury. But because other people would see me limp on different sides, I copped bullying from, like, you know, oh, you're a malingerer. Yesterday you are limping on this side. Like, you know, and so it became, like, torturous to go to work. And not to mention... I was the only female in a whole squadron of men because I had chosen the one role where there was one other woman in the whole Air Force that did it, and that was an aircraft structural fitter. And so I copped a lot of the jokes, a lot of the, you know, oh, it's because you're a woman, it's this, it's that. And so for me, like, I got to the point where I just hated being in the military. And I knew that that's not the case for everyone, but it had beat me down so much. And at the time, I was like, I can't do this anymore. My partner was about to get um, posted out and I was like, I just I just need to go. And so I, I tried to change my job within the military and I was advised that if I changed my job, I'd get kicked out. And so they advised for me to actually go, like discharge and then try and get back in. And so I took the advice from my warrant officer, I discharged. And as I went to apply to get back in, they told me I was unfit for duty never to return to service again. That's what started the full depth of the depression because I had been ill-advised. And so they didn't look after my rehab. I spent the next, it's been 15 years from that journey. I'm still healing that now. Full transparency. Yeah, wow. So, um, uh, sorry, you're still speaking. Go. No, that's what I was just going to say. So um, there was moments where I got really strong. Like, uh, you know, there's, I've had some huge moments in my career where I've like bodybuilding, crossfit, all those sorts of things. But when I had my son, everything opened back up again. So I've been on a really big healing journey, like cleaning it up powerfully now. So ah, yeah. amazing. Well done. And um, we will get around to that part of the conversation. Well, that part of your story, her yeah. story, should I say. <laughs> but yeah, so the the military done a sneaky fucking mm. they set you up basically. So they advise you to discharge because if they discharge you, then you would have got medical, you would have got claims and yeah. support. So I've, and since, all the rest I've of it. since gone down that road and they've legally medically discharged me and looked after me. Like, but this, this has been a 12 year battle. Like, it's not something, um, or well, 15 years, it's not something that um, just happened overnight. And I think what a lot of veterans don't understand is that. When you sign that line, regardless of whether you stay in for one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, there's a life commitment that happens in that. And I don't think I've realised the implication of that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, it's it's an interesting thought process to, that goes with it. Okay, huge. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you mean by that? So, uh, so when you first join, there's on your date of enlistment, there's a, there's a line that you have to sign to like pretty much say that, the military now owns me <laughs> like whatever happens like it's up to them I'll just do say be whatever they want me to be and yeah like seeing now I've been out for 13 years and seeing how it still impacts my life on a regular basis yeah yeah I hear you. the irony isn't left on me is what I'm trying to say yeah it's yeah I get it now yeah it's yeah. interesting though isn't it because mm. all the big gangs of the world you, you need to be jumped in in order mm -hmm. to get into it and then if you ever leave it they say you know in certain gangs obviously the bikers are in australia and whatever other mafias around the world uh blood mm -hmm. in blood out if if you mm -hmm. jump out you get killed or whatever yeah. um but it's interesting here's the here's all the ones that are legal and legit yeah. and they're some yeah. of the worst got to be mindful what i say and i don't want to be mindful but i do think the intentions of every single person who joins the military is pure 
Like that's one thing I 100% believe because I know the people who I enlisted with, I know the people who I joined with, they all have that, but the system isn't set up to support that. And that's yeah. the unfortunate thing. Yeah, just to, just to piggyback that as well, that's what I was highlighting. It's a system mm. that you're going into. They didn't create the military or the gang, even the mm. police. Uh, it's the system. Like, for instance, in Ireland, right, there's, um, there's only 12 doctors per year that get trained. And I had this conversation with my mother-in-law the last time I was back there. But of the last cohort, 11 of them emigrated immediately after they qualified. Only one stayed in Ireland. And, and that's the same. A lot of, if you notice, you go to hospitals and whatever over in Australia, they're full of Irish people because yeah. they're so overworked, underpaid, abused, neglected. All of like just just people doing 24 hour day, like back mm. to back, crazy, ridiculous stuff. And going in and doing surgery, even doctors going and doing surgeries that according to medic, like a medical, their own profession wouldn't allow if they were to get tested because they're sleep deprived, sleep deprived, yeah. no breaks, no rest, and X, Y, and Z. But coming back to the doctor story, of the I was asking Mary, like, why is that the case? Of the eleven that move off. Because when they go into doctorate for the first 12 months, they're like apprentice doctors. So mm. the other older doctors treat them like absolute shit. Treat mm. them like dogs, give them a horrible life, give them all the shit work to do and whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm like, why? Like, like humans culture. are humans. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. the culture. It's the mm. system that's been built. So what, you're going to treat someone like a dog one week and then when they're full doctor next week, you're going to be, ah, oh, what's the story? Do you want to go yeah. for a point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, unfortunately, that's where the way most of the world has been built. Like Yeah, the, 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 most system. of the systems, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Anyways, coming back to your story, I'm, I'm back to fuck the system. Anyways, all the systems. <laughs> you know, it's conversation. <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, we, we won't go down that hole, but uh, coming back to you and your story, so you left the military, yeah, you separated from the other guy. Um, yeah, so it was, about, yeah, it was about four years. I was with him for four years before I separated from him because I started about three years in. I remember he looked at me one day and he was like, every woman has their favourite fat dress, right? It's the dress that they wear when they're feeling frumpy and they don't want to, like they want to feel good. That's <laughs> our favorite fat dress. Yeah, every I woman has it. it. Anyway, every I man has it too. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I put this dress on, and he looked at me, and his words were, "You shouldn't wear that." And I was like, "Why not?" And he's like, "You're too fat for it," because I put so much weight on from the injury, from not being able to move properly, and I just, I just broke down because I knew he wasn't lying. Like there was just such an element of truth that it just hurt. And so I went down to this local boot camp and the guy was like, he'd do like boxing classes and stuff. And I was like, I can't do much, but I think I can just hold the pads and do something. I need to do something to help myself right now. And anyway, within a year, I had lost a whole heap of weight and everyone was like, oh my God, you're so inspiring. You should become a personal trainer. Cause I was starting to like do track triathlons and I was starting to get really involved in stuff because he helped me so much with my rehab. Anyway, I went home to talk to him about it and he was like, you, we can't afford for you to study. And I was like, what? And he's like, we can't afford for you to study. No. Meanwhile, all our money was spent on his cars and like we, we had a lot of just shit that was unnecessary. So I went behind his back and got a loan without him knowing. And that was the start of us separating and me actually choosing what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. so um, cut to it, I, I leave him and then I... I didn't have the balls to start my own business at first. Like I left ah. him to start his business because he was told me, he's like, you can't be in a relationship and have a business. It doesn't work like that. And so I was like, well, I have to either be a stay-at-home mom, which I thought I was infertile. At 18 years old, on top of all of this, I'd been diagnosed with infertility. And so I was like, well, I can't have kids, so I'm out. Like, you know, like, and so I built more protections, more of the strong ones. And then after about three years, I decided to after getting fired from a job for you know being too much of a gym head I um, decided to go and start my own business and I worked in cafes and I ran like four different jobs to get this business off the ground and eventually I became quite a successful personal trainer um 
I had a company and everything like that. And one day I was sitting there with a client and we always used the same box for box jumps, right? It was like mm-hmm. a um, I think it was like 36 inches and it was quite wide. It was like one of those softer padded ones. Um, uh-huh. Anyway, this one day it wasn't there. Someone else was using it. So we had to downgrade to the platform, right? Same height, just smaller area in which she could jump on. The land, yeah. Yeah, she couldn't do it. She was like, I can't do it. It just doesn't feel good for me. Like, And she had a full nervous breakdown in the gym on the floor. And so her and I sat down and we were just talking and I just sort of supported her through it. And it was in that moment I realized like no one's coming to the gym because they need someone to help them exercise. They're coming to the gym because of all the shit that's going on mentally. And at the time I was doing all right with my business, but I also wasn't successful. And so I was like, I need to like help myself. I need to figure out what's going on here, why I'm not successful as I want to be. And so my own drive for success started my personal development journey. And so I got in the room with Aaron Sansoni and he just fucking blew my mind. Like I was like, right, 200 people that are like me, like what is going on? And I came back so inspired. I, I'd also joined network marketing at the same time. And within three weeks, I'm traveling to Texas and I'm doing all this stuff with this company because I just blew right up real quickly. And then I hit burnout really bad. And that's when the the strong girl, the crying on the floor, I want someone to come save me hit. And I met this guy and I thought, I was like, oh my God, a man who believes that I can work and he can still love me. Because I had this belief that no man would love me if I was working and doing what I was doing. Huh. And within a couple of months of living with him, I had realized he was a closet alcoholic our relationship had become so volatile and I was trying to drag him to everything personal development because I was like, I know you can change. I can see your heart, blah, blah, blah. What I realized was you can't change people. And it ended in domestic violence, that relationship, because I was trying to force my will on him so much, trying to get him to change. But I wasn't actually reading that it just wasn't the right fit. Like it just wasn't working. And so I then went on to, this is like a period of like eight years, by the way. So we're yeah, yeah. some pieces here. <laughs> we're on the uh, clock. <laughs> yeah, like I, I declared after yeah, after that, that <laughs> after that I declared that I was going to heal myself and I was going to spend a whole year just learning. And I signed up with these two coaches and Obeying just happened to be in that same program. Uh-huh. And so this was like a month after and I didn't think what anything of it. That? Pardon? What program was that? That was called Become with Abby and Jared back in the day. Oh, yeah, I know them. Yeah, yeah. So that was like way back in the day. And I was like, because I just knew I needed to get myself right and heal myself. Uh Up to like six months later, I'm sitting, I've got a VIP seat, Tony Robbins in the arena. I was just, I just went hard on myself for like cleaning up everything I could energetically because I was like, I made a commitment. I was like, I'm ready to call in my husband. I'm not fucking around anymore. I'm done with all the the trauma from men and the things that I've experienced. And, um, yeah, Bane was sitting two, two rows behind me. Yeah, I'd made this declaration that I was no longer going to um, fear that men couldn't love. And I was just going to get curious around how men could love. And within 24 hours, I'm sitting on a date with a Bane telling him how I'm looking for a husband and I'm doing all the things and he was just like yeah well that's what I'm looking for too cut to back to eight months later I'm thinking I'm infertile I sit in ayahuasca six weeks later I fall pregnant with my son like and just it was like God just started like spitting everything at me that I ever wanted like I can't explain how quickly that shift happened from domestic violence Literally, I ruined my business in that relationship. I had three clients that were paying me $106 a week and I had to call my dad just to pay my rent just to get through that next block of changing my life. And from then until like now, like the rest is history. (laughs) Like (laughs) It's just, it was that matter of like, Mm. it wasn't about anyone else. The the change had to happen with me first. Amazing. yeah, I think yeah, it's crazy. Like to look at it yeah, incredible. 
that's a really good hero story and mm. still only <laughs> i think that's four years off or three years off it's still there's still a bit to go in that yeah. story but well, yeah, one yeah. thing you did say uh, uh at the very somewhere along the lines there was oh my god i'm in a room with 200 people and they're all just like me mm. can you quickly dive into before we celebrate on the next one um mm -hmm. can you quickly dive into the importance of being around people who are like-minded um and how they can help elevate you to success mm. well i think um prior to that room i remember asking myself like why could i never be satisfied and i was always like there's got to be more to life there's got to be more to life like i was constantly like searching for something but what I realized was I was just constantly in the wrong room. Like I was, mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't around people who vibrated at the same level that I did. And like when I actually understood that I am a motherfucking light in this world, <laughs> like I know that when I walk into a room, I have an impact on someone. But mm -hmm. it took me a long time to claim that and a long time to actually bear witness to the reason why I'm here is because my gift is to invoke change in others like even right down to my human design when you look at my life fucking whatever they call it it's like to invoke change in others you know and so for me spending my whole life questioning who am I what am I here for what do I have to do in this life it wasn't necessarily about what I was doing but it was around it was who I was being and who I was around and the minute that I got in that room and I was like these people get me I suddenly like settled in my soul because mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I had to reach or prove myself to friends anymore or anything like that. Like if I didn't want to drink it and it was no longer a problem, like if I didn't want to just sit around and bitch about people, it was no longer a problem because I had people who were also on that same web wavelength as me. Yeah, so I mm. love it. Well done. Mm -hmm. Well yeah. done. Um, mm -hmm. Huge, huge, huge congratulations for those who know and those who don't here we go casey as of today you've officially dropped 14 kgs is that mm -hmm. correct yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'm so go excited on, on it. talk to me tell me Give yeah us well everything. this is the healing part that we we're talking about post pregnancy with my son he's now three and a half i entered back into the injured depressed cycle of feeling like i just couldn't that's, that's a big thing with women too isn't it post post-pregnancy uh, that's it oh yeah postnatal postnatal depression post yeah depression yeah yeah like and and the thing was like I was so good at hiding it like no one knew that I was like navigating this and I was so good at like because I was so good at what I did and how I coached and all those things I could coach myself out of it every single day but it was fucking hard work like really hard work and in that time I gained 20 kilos of weight and so when I met my partner, I had like a six pack. I was super like lean and, you know, I was a personal trainer, right? And then coming in to having gained all that, I just, I felt just not myself as a woman, like completely disconnected. And so um, I remember sitting on the call with Preston, our mentor, and I was like, he was like, I was sitting there and I'm like, I just know that there's something else here and I'm so sick of feeling like this. I said, I feel like I've got no life force. And he was like, you've got the business, you got the family, you got the life, your next up level is through your body. And as soon as he said it to me, it was like a fucking light just went off. Like, it was like, duh. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like I so knew that. how simple it is sometimes. But, <laughs> but what he didn't know was like, like maybe two or three months prior, I'd sat with ayahuasca and I had this vision of myself like the end of this year being lean. And so I knew that like there was something coming, something happening. And anyway, the day after him, I'm talking to one of my other girlfriends and she's like, I'm doing this thing and I've just dropped 20 kilos and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what is going on? I was like, whatever you're doing, just tell me. And I'm just doing it too. And so I signed up with the same coach that she was with. And What's yeah, it's been name? Give him a plug. His name's Colin Watson. My God, go and follow Colin this Watson. man. He is he, he always goes on about he's the number one in health and fitness and there's a fucking reason why. Like yeah. not only did we um, have we been navigating, you know, the physical aspects of losing weight, but he has held me through the trauma that's come with all of it and navigating like 
reconnecting in with my body with trust because when you go from not being able to walk and then there's the fear that that's going to happen again Mm -hmm. it impacted every area of my life my sex life my you know like just sitting down to do work with people like my back would be hurting after an hour like you know it was it was impacting every area of my life and because I was trying to hide that from the world it was like I was just constantly gaining all this weight and this pressure until I actually admitted to myself, I'm not in a good space right now, mm-hmm. like, and stopped hiding it. That's when I actually was able to take ownership. And that's that comes back to the first thing I was talking about. It's like don't hide shit because when you hide shit, you carry it. And it's like the more that you share what's real for you, the less you have to carry the fucking load. And I was physically carrying the load, 14 fucking kilos of it, right? Like yeah. I've got six to go and I'm like counting down because I'm like so in this. So, amazing, yeah. amazing. And something just a light bulb went off. Um, I don't know where I read it or seen it, but the body is a lie detector. Mm. Yes. <laughs> the body is literally, and in the work that we do, it's, uh, it's where we get all our clues from in terms of guiding the client to their their own breakthroughs but Mm -hmm. um it it literally is and and i've uh, also spoke about this in terms of foundations Mm. i've heard many people say you start from the top down so no you fucking don't you start from you don't build a house from the roof down you build it from the foundations up which means you work on the body first and the mindset will come after Mm. because you get clarity on the wisdom along the way I always think of Maslow's hierarchy when I'm like in this because it's like, you know, I was always like, oh, yeah, I used to be feared. I had a six pack, blah, 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 all the things. And then I you get to self-actualization on it, right? But it was like I had to start at the beginning. It's not like linear. Like people think it's linear. And the thing is like when you are as intelligent as I am, I'm just going to read it for a moment, you can fool the world. Like you really can. You can play confidence, you can do all the things, but your body isn't going to fucking lie. Like your body, as much as you can speak it, you can have the gift of the gab, you can convince others, your body will physically show you what's going on every single time. And that's what was happening to me. As much as I was trying to pretend I was okay and give everyone the story that I was okay, my body just kept piling on the weight. And so it was like the minute I stopped lying to myself firstly Mm -hmm. and then like, you know, to my partner and, all of that, everything opened up. Like you've mm-hmm. seen what we navigated in the last six months. We nearly separated over that same stuff. Like, you know. And, yeah. Like, yeah. I huge. was there. I was there. So I yeah. commend you both greatly for the work and the effort that you put in on your relationship. Um, three quick questions, right? Well, they're all huge, by the way. <laughs> I'll try and learn the plane. I'll try. I, I, I don't do fucking shallow questions, but... How important is it in, um, one more thing I will add, um, what you said about, yeah, you can you can fill the world and you can run away from and try to hide everything, but you can't run away from yourself. I just mm. want to tie that down. So what yeah. you're really doing for anybody listening to this is you're compounding your own pain, going all the way back to the start of the pro- uh, podcast or the chat, um, you're building your own prison, essentially. Yeah. So which ties into my question, how important is it for people to accept responsibility for where they're at and be honest with themselves, basically? Oh, mate, I think it's everything. Like, you know, we can we can sit here and blame the world, but nothing changes until we blame ourselves. And not blame in a way where it's like, you know, you're not a good person, but like just taking ownership because we are always in co-creation with God, spirit, universe, whatever you want to call it. Whether you agreed to it consciously or not, there is some part you played here. So when you accept that, that's when you can start to go, all right, let me clean this up for myself. Mm, bingo. Mm. That part. Yeah. So, yeah, Case, an absolute incredible conversation and story. I know you're on the clock with a client. Um, <laughs> land this plane as fast or as long as you want. Oh, here we go, here we go. You know, coming through all the adversity of the addiction in the childhood, the problem of being discharged, self-discharged from the military, and the domestic violence along the way, and even all the weight that you've currently navigated and are absolutely smashing out of the park and out of your body right now. 
Can you help the listener understand the life that you live today and the level that you play at? So in terms of we all go through struggles, yeah. but we can also build X, Y, and Z on the other side of those. Go. Yeah. So just to put it really simply, like I have a relationship that I'm so fucking proud of, like incredibly proud of. I have a man that supports me through everything and just holds me when, you know, coming from a space where, you know, my father wasn't available, all the things that's, that for me is very big. Um, I have an incredible son. So healing infertility on top of that. Like, I think when you look at the physical things that have been healed in my life, you see like this work healed my son, like brought me my son. Like, so for me, that I don't think, oh, that bit's going to make me emotional, but I don't no, think. No, don't be a pussy. <laughs> um, <laughs> say what you were going to say. I talk to Preston about this all the time. It's like if I didn't meet him, I wouldn't have my son because he really helped me heal a lot of what um, I had with men, the wounding that I had. And so I think the level that I play out now is like I literally work with women all over the world, helping them build businesses that just let, light their life on fire. Like, and, you know, I work like eight hours a week and I am with my son and I make, you know, a lot of money doing it and you know it's just I don't think you can put it into words when it comes to that like you know I, I literally get to live and breathe what I want to do and I travel the world doing it and I make fucking hundreds of thousands of dollars every year doing it like I think um you know when I play at this level like you know the mentors that I've worked with like I've worked with you know Grant Cardone, Preston Smiles, Joel Brown, uh I could Robbins give you and the film. Tony Robbins, you know, I've worked with like the biggest in the industry. And I think, yeah, just anchoring yourself into that space of being like, I'm not here to be a big fish. I'm just here to like circulate and make the world and the pond that we're swimming in better. And that for me Amazing. is amazing. Amazing. In other words, helping other women to heal and overcome their yeah. stories. I guess yeah, I know the that we all deserve to play at because we all have the tools. Well, we have the wisdom. Mm. The tools can be learned and the yeah. strategies along the way. So well done. Thank you for your contribution to the world. Um, thank you for bringing Preston up because it's perfect timing. This episode is going to go live next week. So oh, yeah. yes, it is. Come join us in the bridge room. <laughs> Come and join us in the bridge. Um, bridge was the single yeah. biggest thing that led me on this trajectory in life. Um mm. Without Same. going through the bridge, I would not never be with Cersei. I wouldn't be traveling the world. I wouldn't be a coach. I wouldn't be serving others. I wouldn't be, um, yeah, living life on my own terms, basically. Yeah. Living in Bali and all the rest of it. Oh, I most certainly wouldn't have kids with Cersei. But our relationship was at dead end, uh, mm -hmm. rock bottom, before I walked into that room. That was, that was our last hope because I had um, deep abandonment wounds that yeah. I blamed on her so my mm. mistrust in her was really mistrust within myself based on my childhood trauma mm. and the bridge experience was the thing that smashed that to smithereens got me to see what it was that was holding me back and it also got me to, to the place where I could let it go and understand yes. Instead of pointing the finger outwards, it was really uh, my own stuff to deal with. So, Casey, you'll give a quick recap of yours. Oh, man. The bridge for me opened the <laughs> the strong mask wound I spoke about so many times through this. It literally obliterated it. And um, I would I had just met my partner. I was only with him for like a month, and he literally told me, get your ass in the room. Um, And I think he, he did it now in hindsight because he knew that if, I didn't do it, there would be no way that he could ever fully receive what I am as a woman or be with who I am as a woman. So um, my I always say I have a life before and after bridge. My whole life blew up in the best possible way after bridge. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> I went from struggling fucking PT, can't hold a relationship, like, you know, infertile to men of my dreams, life of my dreams beautiful son living in a house that we love like all the things um purely because i built the body that could now hold it rather than run from it every fucking minute i had mm. yeah Casey case absolute gold wisdom all over the shop final question 
the successful mm-hmm. artist man is the name of the podcast. Mm-hmm. What does success mean to you? You know, I think everyone has a different um, opinion of this, but and mine has changed over the years. Uh-huh. But success for me is sitting at home with a calm nervous system, knowing that you did the thing that you were meant to do today. Like that for me, and like when you look around your home and you see the people you love in it and you can just be at peace, that's success. Yes. Mm. Mm. I love it. I love it. I love it because I don't, I, you probably don't know the full depth of why it's called the Successful or is My Podcast. And the mm. reason it is, is to challenge society, society's idea of success. Yes. But... Because it's not the cars and the house and the clothes and the watches and the fucking six packs yeah. and all the rest of it. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, all of us, I know who, what the work that we're doing, we, we've done that. <laughs> didn't work <laughs> it didn't work <laughs> there's a reason why we do what we do now you know like there's a when you learn the body and how it is like success just hits different ah oh, there you go we're gonna finish on that one Casey. <laughs> absolute legend love chatting can't wait to get over to australia i'll be over there next thursday and then um, yeah i'll be on my camper fan fl- fl- i can't wait Yes, yes. let's do it let's do it look at you enjoy you enjoy 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 the rest of your day thanks a million